Okay, there's me and uh, good evening and welcome to Shelf Analysis episode 19. I know this, when I started off doing this, I genuinely thought, sure, we're all going to be in this situation for a couple of weeks. I may as well give this a go. It'll keep us all occupied and, and here we are. And we're going to be here for the foreseeable future as well. So um, uh, it is brilliant that you are still engaging with this. Thank you very much for joining us tonight live in the Ricochet Book Club. Um, don't forget, you can catch all of our older episodes. They are available here in the announcements section, or there is a YouTube channel as well. You'll find the YouTube videos uh, interspersed elsewhere as well of all of our previous episodes uh, right the way up as far as tonight. Our live episode tonight, um, I think... Before I do anything else, I, I figured out a little bit of as to why so many people are engaging with this. Uh, I figured it out last night, because last night, obviously, we weren't on. And um, thank you very much to everybody who watched Sarah Crossan's episode on Monday night. Apologies genuinely for the poorness of the broadband, um, although I didn't realize at the time that it was something that was happening all across the UK and Ireland for everybody who was a, uh, involved and somebody who gets their broadband from a certain provider, that provider being the one that I get mine from. Um, so. Apologies uh, for the slight breakdown we had, although it has been edited out of the one that you'll find on uh, YouTube as well. Sarah Gamely played on, which was just wonderful, which is great. But last night, um, I watched the first in the four parts of the Abbey Theatre's Dear Ireland. Uh, part two is tonight. Good news is it happens immediately after we finish here. So once we finish the show here, you can pop off, go to the Abbey Theatre's YouTube channel and find out more about Dear Ireland. Uh, all four of them are a series of 50 monologues. Those monologues have been put together by uh, Irish playwrights, theater makers, writers, and they are all acted by Irish actors. From last night, the vast majority of them doing it uh, wherever they may be under lockdown and in their own homes. Um, it was an extraordinary experience to be part of last night because there were so many people talking about it online. They had little breaks in between each of the monologues, which gave you the chance to go off and have a wee or tweet about it or do whatever you wanted to do. Episode two is tonight. Uh, and then there are ones on Thursday and Friday as well at 7.30 on the Abbey Theatre's YouTube channel. I know technically not books, but it's just, I, I got it last night as a result of um, as a result of watching a little bit of that. Stuff to plug, stuff that is worth mentioning this coming weekend on The Book Show on RTE Radio 1 at 7 o'clock this coming Sunday evening. Uh, Nisha Dolan, who is a former guest on this show. I talked to her about Exciting Times, which is the new book. Uh, we will also have Mike McCormack talking to a book club from Wicklow about Solar Bones, and they get to ask him a series of questions about that and one of the week's book news as well with Stephanie Preisner. That's this coming Sunday. Sunday evening, RTE Radio 1, 7 o'clock, or you can catch all of the previous episodes and the podcast of this one as well. Just look for RTE Book Show wherever you find your podcasts. Podcast of that will go up on Friday as well. It's bank holiday weekend. Let's try and keep the episode um, as early as we can as well. I'm looking through at other things that I think I need to mention and talk to you uh, about this. One more, just maybe really briefly. And again, technically not book related, but words related. Tomorrow is Poetry Day Ireland. Uh, that's tomorrow, Thursday. Obviously, nothing happening in the real world, so everything is happening in virtual form, but there are so many events that are happening as part of Poetry Day Ireland uh, tomorrow. Have a look at poetryday.ie. Go to their social media channels, and uh, you'll find out everything that they're involved with that's happening tomorrow. They have a lot of stuff lined up, and it's going to be hugely um, well worth your time. Before we get to our guest tonight, who is an author in the UK, I don't ever try to, I don't want to tell you anything. I like teasing. Tonight's an author in the UK. That's all you're getting for now. We will go, of course, to uh, the wonderful Karina Cam. Karina, our houseplant, who recommends books every night. Uh, Karina, what have you got for us tonight? Oh, I probably should have stuck up the graphic, shouldn't I? This is a story of my life. I'm not very good at these kind of things. Let's do that first. The Read Irish Women Challenge Course 2020. Uh, tonight is 29, which is a shortest, longest book. Uh, you are recommending the wonderful Notes to Self by Emily Pine, which is very short. Uh, but one of the best books that I've read uh, in the last few years. If you haven't read um, Notes to Self, Karina is entirely right. Hello, Karina. How are you? Sorry, big hello. How is everything? Are you good? That's fair enough. Thank you, Karina. And Karina's handler for the night as well. Um, and Notes to Self is an extraordinary book. Um, it is a wonderful piece of Irish non-fiction essay writing that if you haven't had the chance to read, you should do so. Um, uh, and I don't need to recommend it to you because so many other people have done so as well. Uh, Emily Pine, the author, is uh, a wonderful speaker. If you get the chance to see her talk at events, um, you should do so as well. Hello, Emily, if you're watching tonight. Karina loves notes to self, and we all do, so that's how that's going. 
Um, there will be a live episode tomorrow night, of course, because it is Thursday. Bank holiday weekend, no episode on Monday, but episodes on Wednesday and Thursday of next week. Two huge episodes next week. And the Thursday one, not least so, because it will be my birthday. And I'm going to sit here with you and celebrate by talking to an author. Yeah. Tonight's guest, um, I'm really thrilled because in particular, her last book is a book that I rattled on about at length in many forums as well. You know, if you were in any way part of the book club or you saw me talking about it online. And then the other night, she just popped into my my thoughts. And then I went, well, probably we should try and have her on the show. And luckily, she just went, yeah, that's absolutely fine. So uh, the author of The Essex Serpent and, of course, Mel Moth. Hello, Sarah Perry. How are you? Hi, I'm really well, thank you. And thank you for having me. Not like you popped into my head the other night because, of course, I was watching University Challenge. <laughs> yeah. and. And they asked a question in which they referenced you, and that the question was about Melmoth the Wanderer, which is the, the, the book that Melmoth um, takes a lot of its, its, its uh, inspiration from. How was that? You obviously had no sense that that was going to happen, or did you? No, I don't watch University Challenge. Obviously should. Um, and I was wasting time on Twitter, which is how I spend most of my waking hours. And my timeline suddenly went alive with everyone telling me that I was on it. And um, yeah, I was just childishly really delighted. And also really delighted that no one got the right answer, which is perverse because you would think I would want everybody to know. But um, I felt like I'd really, you know, uh, been tricky. So yeah, it was good. I, I was yelling it at the screen and going, oh, come on, you're in the final. You people, you should know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's. Um, I, I always presume people know about these things in advance, that you'll have been flagged, you know, you'll have gotten a press release or something or somebody would have sent you a thing saying, oh, by the way, you get mentioned. Just a delightful not, surprise, yeah. Um, you know you've made it, because, you know, not every author gets mentioned on University Challenge. I think that's... that's, that's... I, and I wish my mum had been watching. I could have finally said well, I impressed my mother, but alas, no. <laughs> Um, tell me before we get started into any of this, um, a little bit about you over the last few weeks, about where you are, about how you've been getting on with all of this and how has real life been for you? So uh, I live in Norwich um, and uh, just my husband and a dog and a cat um, and I've had this really weird experience of feeling quite guilty about how um, privileged my life is just to be able to go out into the garden and have the dog to walk and to have a partner has been a lot, I'm in mean, a much better position than a lot of people are. But alongside that I've had this really creeping sense of sort of uselessness because it's not like me to to not be able to get stuck in and there was a really strange sensation that to just sort of sit in my study and make up stuff felt like a waste of time when this catastrophe was unfolding so it was a long time before I was able to pull myself together and think actually no books do matter and actually in the aftermath of this everyone's going to want to read and so my job I can't do anything useful now but I can do something useful for when we come out of it and then I can kind of entertain terrify <laughs> Confuse all the things I like to do. Terrifying, confusing, great, l l love that. I'm, I'm one of the conversations we've had, obviously, with most of the authors here, has been that about finding it hard to, for whatever reason, to, to, to dig in and do the work that authors do every day, the sitting down and the, you know, the grinding yeah. out of a book or doing or doing whatever you're doing. I think we've only spoke to maybe one or two who've just gone, nope, fine, and everybody else has been yeah, completely lost. Of it. Are you in the middle of something at the moment? Are you, are you writing, editing? What, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm um, I'm working on my next book and um, I'm redrafting it. So I finished a draft and then I got to the end and thought, oh, no, I don't like that um, and decided I wanted a completely different approach. And so I'm now redrafting it. And um, I was so unhappy when I did the first draft, I think. Um, and now I feel full of, well, I did feel a kind of great joy and purpose that I was doing what I wanted to do. And um, I'm just starting to regain that. And the really great thing is that... Um, I really like to use my books to explore things that I'm interested in and I'm very passionate about um, astronomy and I have a very good telescope and I was brought up uh, you know watching stars so um, even while I haven't been able to write I have been able to um, you know, get my telescope out and read about the planets read about physics and kind of keep my brain alive which has been good. 
God, I'd love to be in, outside of a city somewhere with the ability to be able to do something like that. That's fantastic. Lifelong astronomy nut here as well. I thought that oh, really? Oh, well, you know, so we, we live in the city centre, but because there's back gardens backing onto each other and because, because this is a really perverse thing, there's so much about this situation is catastrophic and terrifying, but so much of it is conducive to wonder. And because there's so little pollution, the night skies, I, mean, I think we've all noticed the night skies have been absolutely astounding this has been at its elongation it's been very very bright and very near um so even in our back garden and um, with the telescope that i have i've been able to see galaxies and nebulae and um you know all sorts of things it's been really Ooh. amazing and it, it, it's strange we're going to go off on, a, on an astronomy tangent just for a second because you're here i had this moment today where where i thought there was a, a an article around the guardian today about an asteroid there is quite a substantial asteroid that's going to come within whatever it is about 3.9 million miles of earth yeah. And it's about a mile wide, and you know it's the sort of thing that would ultimately cause extinction level event catastrophe if it were closer. And I thought this isn't going to get picked up by anybody. It's not in the news cycles because at the moment it's just not important right now. Yeah, it doesn't and register. Well, and also, I don't know if you saw, but the Pentagon has released some footage that basically says, "Yeah, UFOs are real," and everyone's just sort of going, "Oh well, um, you know, we've we've got other things to think about at the moment." But I think that's what's so wonderful about being interested in astronomy is that it is so immense that it's kind of annihilating you know if you if you do think about it if you do go out in your back garden and you know you get your binoculars out and you look for the sea of idleness and the sea of tranquility on the moon when there's a full moon it's like flight you kind of leave behind the world and i think it's sort of been the thing that's kept me just on the right side of sanity for the last few weeks as um, being able to kind of engage with something that's just indifferent, indifferent to viruses, indifferent to fear, just carrying on in its calculations the whole time. It's been really good. I, I, th I think that's frequently good at any point in your life, wherever you want to get a sense of your own real actual position in the universe. Just look up, just find yeah. Orion, just look up and realise that, you know, exactly. whatever it is that's happening, it's not that important. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so, sorry, so let's, you know, the chin chin and all that, because you said you were going to yeah. have one of these, I have one of these, yours is, there you go, one of those, is yours, what's yours, Scottish? Oh, Glen mm. Farkless, and it's in a glass from Prague. Mm, very nice. Which I was supposed mine, mine to be is, uh, mine is, mine is, mine is kind of a combination, mine is Dingle uh, whiskey from the wonderful people at Dingle Fair Play, but that's in a Teeling's glass, which is my, that's, so this is both Kerry and Dublin's finest, um, all, all in, a, in a combination. Right, let's focus because allegedly we have work to do here tonight. I want to talk to you about Melmoth, because despite me talking about it so much and enjoying it so immensely, you and I never did an event together, so we never really got to speak about this. I never got to interview you about Melmoth. Maybe just briefly tell people about the, the book, because it, it's, it's been out for a while now. Tell people about the book, what it was about, and, 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 and we can talk about it just a little. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, importantly, it has its roots in Ireland, of course, um, and in the novel Melmoth the Wanderer, which is written by Charles Robert Maturin. And he was... Great guy, was mad as a March Hare, and he was very, very poor, um, but he still used to wear very beautiful clothes and dance about his, his vicarage. Um, and he had this great social conscience, and he would go up into his pulpit in, his, in the Irish town where he lived and castigate his audience for the terrible things that were happening in Ireland under English rule. He was a real kind of firebrand and, and, and furious about everything all of the time. And he wrote this horrifying novel about a man who sold his soul to the devil, um, and of course, as I'm sure all your uh, listeners and viewers will know, um, his great, great nephew was Oscar Wilde, which is why Wilde would sign his name Sebastian Melmoth when he signed into hotels. Um, and so when I read it, I thought, God, I would really like to write a book where Melmoth is a woman and Melmoth uh, as a woman can do all of the things that Maturin's Melmoth does. So visit people all over the world in different time zones in horrifying places. And so in my Melmoth there's a woman who's 2,000 years old and she's cursed to bear witness to terrible events and she turns up if you've done a bad thing. And she kind of offers you a choice and she says you can either give up all hope and you know accept you'll never find redemption, you'll never be happy again um, and come with me or you can stay and face the consequences of your actions. So it's, you know, it's a great laugh, essentially. <laughs> it is not a great laugh. It is one of the creepiest, most utterly terrifying books I have ever read. And I'm a 46-year-old man. I tend not to find things randomly terrifying. There were nights where I had it, had to close it and just put it to one side because I couldn't go on. And that's the Absolutely. highest form of recommendation. Yeah, yeah, I'm really chuffed. <laughs> um, 
uh, ostensibly we have people on to talk about books that they would like to recommend to other people. So you've been for forage through your own bookshelves today. Have, and yeah. what have you come up with? Well, uh, one of them I can't find because I made the fatal error of putting it somewhere safe. Um, and that's Lucy Atkins's novel, Magpie Lane. And I don't know if you've read it or your readers have seen it, but um, I, I haven't really been able to read very much. I've only really been reading poetry because um, my concentration span is shot for all the obvious reasons. And then I picked up Magpie Lane and two days later had been kind of cradled in this incredibly satisfying, slightly gothic, very tender, very beautifully written mystery. Uh, set in Oxford, Kid Goes Missing. Can't recommend it enough. It's an absolute banger. It really is. And then um, this book, Sean, uh, Sean Hewitt, Tongues of Fire. Um, I, I, don't, I went through a phase of saying I hated poetry and I would go on Twitter and say I hate poetry and then loads of furious poets would find me and say that they hated my books in retaliation, which yeah. I found quite amusing. That can happen. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I love poetry, as a matter of fact, and this is just extraordinary. And the title, I think, which is the uh, the last poem, indicates what the book is about, because Tongues of Fire, obviously, is talking about the Pentecost um, when Tongues of Flame descended, but it's also a very erotic, suggestive phrase. And I've, it's very rare to find a poet, poet that so kind of completely and perfectly conflates the erotic life and the spiritual life um, and sort of wonderful writing about the natural world. Everybody should immediately order this from their nearest independent bookseller. I maybe, think. Maybe just before you move on, it's really interesting that you know one of the threads that's come from talking to, to, to people over the last while on, on, on the show is is poetry and a rediscovery yeah. of poetry because concentrations are shattered for, for, for one reason or another. It, 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 that's obviously something you found as, as well over the course of the last while too. Yeah, absolutely. And I've been reading um, anything that contains kind of very intense bursts of feeling or thought, but in short chapters or paragraphs. So, um, and so which leads me on actually to one of the other things that I'm reading at the moment, which is this extraordinary book, which came out oh, wonderful. a while ago. Yeah. Um, so I rather hubristically decided I was going to do A-level physics um, last year and I have been studying for it, but I'm hampered by the fact that I basically can't count. <laughs> so, um, there's a, there's lot a lot of maths involved. There, there is. is. There really is. That's why I avoided it. It's ridiculous. And my mum's a retired maths teacher. And honestly, after the fifth time I'd phoned up in tears about quadratic equations, she was like, you know, you might have to do GCSE maths before you can do A-level physics. So instead of A-level physics, I bought this. And it's... Um, it's very short lessons on gravity, quantum gravity, time, space, um, black holes. It's absolutely extraordinary and couched in the most amazing kind of poetic language. And even when your concentration is blasted by worry, you can sort of lose yourself in four exquisite pages about black holes. And for at least 24 hours afterwards, you really understand it. It fades away after that, but it's a blissful, it's a blissful time while it lasts. Um, yeah, I, I, had, I had one of those moments with that book as well, in that I'm the sort of person who has spent a life being fascinated by, by physics with absolutely no aptitude of any kind whatsoever, no grounding, no ability. But I find I find the concepts of it really interesting. And I did. I read that book um, when it came out, whatever, about a year ago. I read it when it came out, came out in hardback. And you're right, it is so bite-sized and economical yeah. and you will get a broad sense of what everything is about even though you're not going to get you know an, an in-depth look because that's a much yeah. longer book or a course or a lifetime um and he does he he, he writes beautifully and I, I don't think enough people came across that that's a, that's a brilliant choice no i mean it should be it should should have been sort of number one i think and it it kind of it reminded me of, I think Einstein said, the definition of a true genius is to be able to explain the most complicated concepts in the world in a way that a layman can understand. And anybody briefly could understand some really complicated stuff um, at his hand. So I've got three more of his books now to read, but they're, they're not quite so brief. So we'll, maybe I'll wait until the apocalypse is finished and I can concentrate a bit more. There'll be plenty um, of time then. Yeah, loads. So um, this is my latest kind of random eBay find. So in 1986, Halley's Comet came round and uh, the European Space Agency produced this amazing book and presented it to the Pope as like a prize for having been Pope when Halley's Comet kind of did the rounds. Okay. And it had amazing things in like images of the center of Halley's Comet which for 1986 is incredible astrophotography. This is yeah. four years before 
um, Hubble. So it's kind of weird, very tactile, very 80s kind of mock leather. Is it, I mean, it's like a, it's like a co it's like a coffee table book version of that. Right? Yeah. Who, who, that, that was put together by the ESA, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's the ESA, and then like handed over to the Pope by the head of ESA. And the reason it was given to the Pope, you see this picture on the front. Mm. That's Giotto's painting of the Nativity, and this is Halley's Comet. Mm. So Giotto mm. saw Halley's Comet, and then when the European Space Agency made a probe to photograph it, they called it Giotto. Yeah. So, I, I'm kind of really keen on this. And then finally, I'm trying to get my concentration back by reading an enormous book. <laughs> so this is the Alexandria Quartet um, by Lawrence Durrell, which I had not heard of until people were talking about it on Twitter, which I think is how I get half my book recommendations. Um, and it's the, the first book is, is called Justine, and it's set in, in Alexandria during the war. And it's a very strange, heady, intense recollection of a doomed love affair. And it's incredibly transporting because you'll be reading it on kind of a rainy afternoon in Norwich. Um, and he's describing the dust being thrown up by the wheels of the car and the beggars in the street and the men selling coffee and these beautiful women with their furs going out dancing. And this man is obviously devastated by a broken heart and incredibly bitter, but still in love with the idea of being in love. And it's incredibly transporting and really weird. It has no linear time at all. He just meanders around. It's great. I've almost got gone the same way as well in that I'd gone through reader's block as well. I found it really hard. I, I read voraciously uh, and I'd, I'd managed, I think, two books over the space of four weeks or five weeks. And eventually I managed to kind of nudge it and get the block going out. So then I decided this time, actually, I've still got it here. I mentioned it here before, which is David Mitchell's new book, Utopia yeah. Avenue, uh, which is, you know, substantially sized. Although I'm I'm starting it and I've enjoyed it immensely so far. It's a, it's a it's a crack and read um, so far. Actually, I, I wanted to while you're here. I forgot to do something earlier on because normally I recommend a book at the beginning of all these. This arrived in the post um, today. Thank you, Cormac, if you're watching, um, because I mentioned much earlier on in the series her book, The Lonely City, when I was talking about books that might, people might find interesting or useful around times like this. So this is Olivia Lang's. Funny weather, art in an emergency. It's brand new. It is beautiful. Oh, that's a tactile cover and a half right there. It is just gorgeous. And it's Olivia Lang's ooh, right there. It is Olivia Lang's nonfiction writing uh, on pretty much everything. Books, art. Um, I, 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 you know, sometimes certain things come in and you go, yes, you're next. You're the one yeah. that's going to, to, to happen next. So that I did mean to plug a little bit earlier on. I didn't really get the, uh, the chance to as well. Um, hang on, I have a couple of questions for you. So firstly, Emer says, Melmoth is a fabulous read. Less of a question, more of a love bomb. So that's oh, good. Oh, thank you. Stephanie Grace says, hi, Sarah. Loved Melmoth. Read it over a year ago. It was a terrific story. Caroline says, I don't give much thought to physics, but the book sounds very interesting. Would you recommend it as just a book to enjoy, says Caroline? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because the, uh, Carlo Rovelli, who wrote it, writes in this extraordinary kind of poetic language. And he's writing for people like us. He's not writing for fellow physicists. It's like going to a dinner party and the most fascinating man in the world happens to be sitting next to you. And you say, so what do you do? And then an hour later, you've just been completely transported. That's exactly what it's like. I think, and I'm going to say this out loud, which is one of my major problems in life, and I'm probably going to be entirely wrong. I think that was based on a series of newspaper articles he wrote for, he writes for an Italian newspaper. And I think that's where that's the right. origin of all of that comes from. So he's writing for a general audience as opposed to yeah. you know, writing for specialists um, in any way. Okay, thank you. Didn't get that one wrong. Excellent. Good news. Sarah says, I studied physics many, many moons ago. Uh, I'll have to check it out and reawaken my love of physics. Um, but before we finish up, and I know some people are very cautious about this and, and rightly so. Can you tell us anything about what you're writing or is that something that you just, you, you keep in a box and you don't say anything about it? And that's no. fine if that's what it is. No, it's okay. I, um, I, I never know how often I've bored on about this and everyone's sick of hearing about it, but I had quite a strange upbringing. So I was brought up in a, in a very, very strict, quite closed religious um, sect. Um, and I joke and say I was born in about 1860, um, so my childhood <laughs> was essentially Victorian, um, and I've never written about it before, and so um, the, the background for the story that I'm telling um, is very much the background that I was born and brought up in, in a, in a very strict and rather strange 
but not unpleasant um, community in Essex. Um, and um, as you can perhaps predict, my, my narrator is an astronomer. So um, I really enjoy using my novels as a chance to get interested in as much stuff as I can. So, you know, I've had surgery and I've had um, historical atrocities and I've had monsters and now I've got the stars, which is it's really good. I hope. Fantastic. <laughs> I, I have um, my, my own wife who acts as the, the producer on this show. And as I joke, she's the one who's working me with the pedals behind here, says, I love Sarah's decor. I love the color. I love the awesome looking piano. Does she play? I do. Yeah. But badly nowadays. Otherwise, I would immediately play some Bach. Um, but I, I played a lot when I was younger. And I'm now, as we're all in quarantine, I'm doing some practice. So. And is that your writing area where you are as well? Or are yeah, you just in, in so your if I was in my, so this is my study, I can turn my, ah, this is not my laptop, otherwise it'd be much easier. So that's my piano and then shell yoga mat, you know, keeping it, keep myself limber. I have a fireplace. I mean, it's disgustingly lucky, really. So I quite like a kind of very cold day when I have an excuse to light the fire in my study. Um, and I'm at my desk, which is an enormous teacher's desk that I got from eBay. Plenty of space for piles of paper and I that. love your I love your lamp. That's a gorgeous lamp in the corner. That's that's a, I would covet that lamp. It's, it does the job, yeah. Um, it has been lovely um, tonight and getting to talk to you finally as well after having read and, and, and enjoyed your books and, and you and I talked to each other on, on social. If, if there's one thing that has come out of the situation that we're all in that is a, that is a positive, there's, there's only a couple of them, but one of them is that, you know, this has occurred and it's allowed um, the likes of us to all have these conversations and, yeah. and talk to other people about books. It's been lovely talking to you. I'm really Thank looking you. forward to Thank the new you. book and Thank fingers you. crossed with the work and uh, have yourself a very safe, safe rest of however long all of this may be. And Thank Sarah you. Perry, thanks a million for joining us tonight. Cheers. Thank you, bye-bye. Good night. Oh. Um, thank you, Sarah, for uh, joining us on the show. Remember the book, the, the most recent of Sarah's book, books, uh, Essex Serpent is great, but the most recent of her books is The Wonderful Mail Moth. If you're looking for something that would completely creep the living bejesus out of you, and it did me, and is beautifully written as well um, as a book, Mail Moth has been out uh, in, uh, in hardback for a while, and I think it's made a paperback since the tail end of uh, last year as well. That's it for tonight's show, Thursday night's uh, shelf analysis, which is tomorrow night. That's good, me keeping up on days of the week. That's how we're all gonna get through this. Uh, tomorrow night, we talk to um, an Irish author in the UK who coincidentally is one of my actual real world friends and I'm thrilled to get to talk to her and do an interview like this and with her because she's had a big week. So that's it tomorrow night. We'll catch you again here in the Ricochet Book Club uh, live at seven o'clock. Don't forget all of the previous episodes are archived in the announcement section here in the Ricochet Book Club. You'll be able to find them on RTE Culture as well. And um, they're archiving all of our uh, uh, stuff there as well. And RTE Culture, good spot to just go and have a nose around and see what's happening in the culture world as well. And you'll find everything as well in the new YouTube channel. There are details on all of my social media feeds if you look at my Instagram. Uh, or my Twitter, you'll find details for where the YouTube channel is. That's it for tonight. Uh, other than that, to all of you, my friends, chin chin, and uh, see you same time. Uh, see you same time tomorrow night here on the show from seven o'clock and tomorrow morning on RTE Gold from 10 as well. Uh,